So uh, it is my pleasure to uh, open this uh, afternoon session uh, with uh, Nathan Berkowitz uh, as a speaker. There is, of course, no need uh, to explain, uh, to introduce uh, Nathan to everybody knows uh, very well Nathan. And uh, his talk is about the manifest space time superstrymetry and super string. So please, Nathan. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some recent work, but of course it's related to things I've done in the past. Um, but let me start by just thanking the organizers, especially Hey Mundo, uh, and also um, I, I, inviting everybody to obviously participate in strings next week. So um, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about some recent work which just appeared on the archive last week. Um, and the idea is to try to construct a formalism closely related to the RNS formalism for the superstring, but which has manifest space-time supersymmetry. Now, the, there already exists manifestly space-time supersymmetric formulations for this string, um, either the Green-Schwartz or the pure spinner formalism, but neither of them are completely understood. And by constructing a manifestly space-time supersymmetric version of the RNS formalism, the idea is that we will understand better, um, or at least the pure spinner formalism, uh, maybe also the Green-Schwartz formalism. Okay, so I'll start by just discussing some motivation, and then I'll give a review. So this is supposed to be accessible to people who are not familiar with the different technical aspects of the superstring. So please feel free to, to interrupt me and ask questions whenever you want. Um, so you can raise your hand and I guess um, I'll see you or uh, Francesca will see you. Okay, so after I give a review, I'll discuss this you new work where we um, generalize the RNS formalism to a formalism with manifest space-time supersymmetry. And then in the last part of the talk, I will show how to relate this space-time supersymmetric formalism with the pure spinner formula. Okay, so motivation. So I, I think everybody is probably familiar with the RNS formalism. So it has manifestly uh, supersymmetry, but on the world sheet, not in space time. So um, the, the, world, the supersymmetry it has on the world sheet is a local supersymmetry. Um, so don't confuse that two dimensional supersymmetry with the supersymmetry I'm gonna talk about today, which is the 10 dimensional space time supersymmetry. And I'll, I'll explain that's hidden in the RNS formalism. So although it's present, um, it's difficult to find the implications of space type supersymmetry in the RNS formalism. So for example, when you do computations, you have to sum over spin structures. And if you want to compute calculations involving external fermions, they're very complicated using the RNS formalism. This makes it also very difficult to describe Ramon Ramon backgrounds, which of course are necessary if you want to describe the, the superstring in, in, ADS, in ADS space. On the other hand, the pure spinner formalism, which was developed um, 20 years ago now, um, it has manifest space-time supersymmetry, but the world sheet symmetries are hidden. So in some sense, it uh, has the opposite advantages and disadvantages from the RNS formalism. So cancellations from the supersymmetry, from the 10-dimensional supersymmetry are manifest, um, and all the calculations that have been done in both formalisms agree but it turns out that the, because of this manifest supersymmetry, there's some computations you can do in the pure spinner formalism, which have not yet been done in the RNS formalism. So for example, some three loop superstring computations done by Carlos Marfa and Umberto Gomez have not yet been done in the RNS formalism. And essentially because the space-time supersymmetry simplifies the computations. But on both sides, there are certain subtleties. So going beyond three loops in RNS or in pure spinner is, is, is um, is difficult, um, but it's difficult in different ways. And it would be very nice to understand, uh, even though they, they both have subtleties, it would be very nice to understand how the subtleties are related to each other. So as I mentioned, what we'll describe today here is a generalization of RNS, which has manifest space-time supersymmetry. So in some sense, it sits in between the usual RNS formalism and the pure spinner formalism. And hopefully by betting, better understanding um, this generalized RNS, we'll be able to understand the relation between the RNS and the pure spinner, and especially these multi-loop subtleties. Okay, so let me start by giving a review of the different formalisms. So let's start with RNS. So this 
So I think people are probably familiar with the basics. So you have the matter fields, you have the 10 X's and the 10 Psi's, and then you have the BC Virazora ghosts, which essentially can be used to gauge away two of the X's. And you also have the beta gamma ghosts, which are bosonic, coming from the superconformal symmetry, which you can use to gauge away two of the Psi's. And this size are half integer fields, so you can either choose periodic or anti-periodic boundary conditions if you're doing the closed string. So the periodic boundary conditions are called Ramon sector and the anti-periodic are called never Schwartz sector. And if you want to describe space-time fermions, that comes from the Ramon sector, whereas the space-time bosons come from the never Schwartz sector. So the BRST operator is straightforward to construct. Um, so it's of course, um, has the usual stress tensor part. And then you also get the contribution from the superconformal stress tensor of spin three halves. Okay? And then you get some ghost couplings also. So the physical states are states which are annihilated by Q. And if you look at the simplest version of the vertex operators, which are called zero picture, the gluon vertex operator is a form which is very similar to the gluon vertex operator in bosonic string theory. In bosonic string theory, you just have the first term. Whereas in the super string, you also have a coupling of the field strength of the gluon to the spin field, psi m, psi n. And then you also get a coupling to the gamma ghosts of this form. So it's easy to show this vertex operator is BRST closed when the gluon is on shell. But now when you want to do the gluino, life is more complicated. So you have to, this was done by Friedan Martin Schenker in 1986. So 15 years after the formalism was developed. And it actually it was a huge challenge before Friedan Martin Schenker to compute fermion scattering, but after it became relatively straightforward, but one needed to bosonize these beta and gamma ghosts. So beta and gamma are of course, bosons of conformal weight minus one half and three halves, and then you bosonize them. So eta, if you like, fermionize them. Eta and C are fermions, and phi is a chiral boson. You also, it's convenient to construct a spin field by bosonizing the size. So you split the size into 10 pairs, and you bosonize them, and then the spin field can be constructed as a space-time spinner. And the fermionic vertex operator, at least in its simplest form, is a product of the spin field with this, these bosonized beta gamma ghosts. So as you can see, the structure is much more complicated. And if you want to generalize this, so everything I will talk about today is for the open string, or if you like the left moving sector of the closed string. And if you want to do the Ramon Ramon backgrounds, you're supposed to take the left right product. And of course, things are going to be messy because it's going to be the left right product of, of this operator here. So it'd be something like C e to the minus phi over two. And then you'll get something from the right moving sector. Which would couple to the Ramon Ramon field. And because this vertex operator includes both um, these bosonized ghosts and matter fields, uh, it's, it's tricky to couple it to a sigma model and try to construct scattering amplitudes. As I will discuss later, there's also a problem related to picture. So because of this e to the minus phi over two, it turns out that the, if you take the OP of the gluino with the gluino, you don't get the gluon in this picture. You get the gluon in what's called picture minus one. And somehow you have to do some a procedure called picture changing to get you back to the right picture. So space-time supersymmetry, of course, relates these two vertex operators and the fact that they have very different form, this means the space-time supersymmetry is far from manifest. Okay? So of course, what I'm talking about now is in the GSO projected sector. So if you work in the GSO projected sector, you know that you have space-time supersymmetry. I'm not going to discuss tachyons and other fields in the GSO unprojected sector here. Okay, so please stop me or raise your hand if you have any questions. Okay, then the next form I'm going to briefly discuss is the Green-Schwartz formalism, or I will call it Green-Schwartz-Siegel formalism, because there's some features which Siegel introduced. So again, one has these bosonic fields XM and the BC ghosts, but now the fermionic sector is space-time spinners. So alpha is 1 to 16. 
And Siegel introduced a conjugate momentum to theta alpha, which you call P alpha. So theta alpha and P alpha are both fermions. Okay. So you can construct a BRST operator. So it's just the bosonic ghost, the C ghost times the stress tensor. But you immediately see things are, are different than in RNS. So the naive counting of the central charge is wrong. Uh, you don't get cancellation. And uh, the theory, if, well, okay. What you find is that the BRST operator does not give the right physical spectrum. What you have to do is add additional constraints. And these constraints are described by this D alpha here. So D alpha is a combination of P alpha. P alpha is like DD theta and theta. And if you like, it's the world sheet analog of the operator D alpha if you work in superspace. So this would be the, the world, this would be the, the field theory version of the supersymmetric derivative. This is the world sheet version of that. So P alpha is like DD theta and DX is like DDX. Okay, these D alphas, they satisfy an algebra, but the algebra, because it's not a constraint, it means that the algebra has both first class and second class constraints. So it turns out that D alpha has eight first class and eight second class constraints. And pi M here is the supersymmetric version of DX. So the formalism is manifestly space-time supersymmetric. And in fact, you can show that all the BRST operator and D alpha commute with these space-time supersymmetry generators. And the space-time supersymmetry generators satisfy the usual supersymmetry algebra where D, the integral of DX is just, this is just gamma M alpha beta PM. And Q alpha, it's easy to see that it generally generates the usual superspace transformations of theta alpha and X under global supersymmetry. So although space-time supersymmetry is manifest, there's a problem because of these second class constraints. So covariant quantization of this formalism is still an open problem. So you need the BRST operator, but you need some extra constraints. Okay, but if you like, this was uh, a key ingredient to constructing the pure spinner formalism, which we do know how to quantize. So the pure spinner formalism has the similar X and theta and P variables as in green schwartz siegel but it introduced some ghost variables. So I see I haven't changed yet. The, my screen is frozen, but Francesco, you can see this screen of your spinner. Is that correct? No, we're still on space time supersymmetry is manifest in the previous one. So this is kind of oh. green shorts. So something is bad. It's possible that my, let me try to share screen again. It's possible that the share screen went down. So while you're doing that, can I ask you a question with the first yep, slide? Yeah. Uh, so I guess there might be other people from vertex address here. So for me, when you say beta gamma and you put conformal weights minus one half and three halves, that's very strange. So typically we would say conformal weights one and zero. So okay. I so if, there's... if we're doing the RNS formalism, then the, then the fermionic stress tensor has conform weight three halves, right? Oh, so probably these beta gammas are just so something like if I take the supersymmetric partners of that, that's what I would call beta, beta and gamma, perhaps. Yeah, so yes. at least that, so that the beta have, and okay, gamma good. are the ghosts. Okay. If you like, they come from gauge fixing the world sheet superconformal symmetry. So let me try something else. Like, yeah. Let me share a screen with my PDF file that I sent to you. That would work okay. So let me do it that way. Um, so just one second. Sorry about this. Just one second. Okay. So it's gonna be a little uglier, but um, I think it'll be okay.
you're only connected with one account now. So perhaps the other one. Yeah, the other one died. Okay. You can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Let me just. Okay. Okay, so it's a little bit uglier, but I'll keep going. Okay, so we've done the um, the Green Schwartz Siegel, and now we're on the pure spinner formalism. So we have these variables x and theta, and we also have these lambda w variables, which are now going to play the role of ghosts. So now, in fact, everything has conform weight zero and conform weight one, and we can write down the BRST operator. In a, in a form in which it, I combine these pure spinner ghosts with these d alpha of the previous Green Schwartz Siegel. So these d alphas here. So these are the same as in the Green Schwartz Siegel formalism, but now we have these extra ghosts. And these ghosts are defined to be pure spinners. And that's going to be crucial because otherwise the BRST operator would not be nil potent. So if you take the Q squared, and you use the fact that d alpha with d beta has these second class constraints, then you need to use lambda gamma lambda equals zero so that Q squared equals zero. Now, the nice feature of these, this formalism is that the vertex operators are now manifestly space time supersymmetric. So the vertex operator for the open string for the gluon and gluino are now combined into this 10 dimensional superfield. So AM is the gluon field and chi is the gluino field. Okay, so in 10 dimensions, you can describe super Yang Mills in superspace for the on shell super Yang Mills multiplet in this way. And in fact, you can also, A alpha is a gauge superfield because it depends on the glue, glue on it, glue on with not the field strength, but you can also construct superfields which, uh, which start instead of starting, um, so this, this AM starts with the gluon at order zero and theta. This WL for superfield starts with the gluino, and FMN starts with the field strength. So these are all related. These are all 10 dimensional superfields, which are related by hitting with superspace derivatives. This is the unintegrated vertex operator in the pure spin of Lindsay V, and this is the integrated vertex operator U. So the, um, it's slightly different from uh, the, the RNS formalism, where if you remember, Let's go back. The vertex operator had a piece here which was proportional to the C ghost, but here there's no C ghost, there's no BC ghost. But in any case, these two vertex operators are related to, the, to each other by the fact that if you take the BRST operator on the, on the integrated vertex operator, you get the derivative of the unintegrated vertex operator. So the structure is very similar, but the BRST operator is just put in by hand. So it doesn't come from gauge fixing as we did in the RNS formalism. Okay, so that's a review of the three formalisms. And now I'd like to say something about, um, okay, in the pure spinner formalism, you can easily describe Ramon Ramon backgrounds. They come from deforming uh, with the closed string version of that vertex operator. So it's just the left right product of two open string vertex operators. So of course, because the gluino sits here, the vertex operator for the field strength is just going to be d alpha left times d alpha right. It's going to be very simple. So it's completely straightforward to write down Ramon Ramon background. Now, um, if you want to have manifest supersymmetry, the first thing to do is to understand what's necessary. So um, the usual supersymmetry algebra is Q alpha with Q beta is gamma M alpha beta times PM. So that's in any dimension. And Supersymmetry can be made manifest if the algebra closed without using equations of motion. So that's a crucial ingredient. So a typical example, if you're familiar with four-dimensional supersymmetry, is a scalar multiplet in four dimensions. So the scalar multiple in four dimensions has a complex boson, so this phi, complex scalar. It has the fermion, which I'll call chi. So here A and A dot just go from one to two. These are just the four components of a four-dimensional gluon. Nathan, we're not seeing the bottom of that slide, that perhaps you're seeing it. Oh, That's um, Can you see it now? No? Yeah, a little bit. Sorry. 
Uh, if you want to wait three minutes, I can try to log back on with the other computer. Um, uh, let me keep going. Okay, let me keep going. Sorry about maybe that. You, maybe now you can scroll, right? Well, it's a PDF version, so I'm only seeing the PDF. Version. Okay, uh, sorry about this. So these are the three fields. So we have phi, we have chi A, and we have F. And if you work just with phi and chi A, the supersymmetry uh, transformation of phi is just chi A. The supersymmetry transformation of chi is derivative of phi. And this algebra does not close without using equations of motion. In order to get it to close, you also need a transformation of Q on chi, not on chi bar, which transforms into F. So the point is that if you don't introduce this F, the supersymmetry algebra closes only using equations of motion which means that you can't make supersymmetry manifest. One way to see that is that you only have two uh, scalars. So you have phi and phi bar, which are complex, but you have four fermions because you have chi A and chi bar A dot. So it's clear if you want to have supersymmetry manifest, you need an equal number of bosons and fermions off shell, which is why you have to introduce this auxiliary field F. So the point is that um, if you want to work in in superspace or to make supersymmetry manifest, you need the supersymmetry algebra to close without using equations of motion. Okay? And that requires the introduction of this auxiliary field F and F bar. Okay, so that's, that's a clue that uh, we're going to use when we make space-time supersymmetry manifest in the RNS formulas. Hmm? And now I didn't say this, but why do you want makes, to make supersymmetry manifest? So one reason is of course, so that when you do computations, the supersymmetry cancellations are manifest. Another reason is that if you want to describe interactions, it's much easier to describe interactions if you're working in superspace. So for example, it's trivial to write down interactions involving the superfield just by writing down superspace integrals using phi. Okay, now let's go to the RNS formalism. So in the RNS formalism, as I told you, if you want to write the fermionic vertex operator, it's constructed using the spin field and e to the minus phi over two constructed divide, um, multiplied by the spin field. Now, when you compute the anti-commutator of Q alpha and Q beta, you find that you don't get the usual translation generator. You get this object here. That's easy to see just by e to the minus phi over two with itself is going to give you an e to the minus phi. And sigma alpha with sigma beta, if you take the OPE and use this bosonization, you just find that it's equal to gamma m alpha beta psi n. Okay, if you want to see the supersymmetry algebra, you have to use an operation called picture raising. So picture raising is going to relate this operator here with the usual translation generator, which is dxm. Okay, so I have to tell you a little bit about picture raising. So this is something, um, of course, it's in books of Bolchinsky, but it's, it was also developed by Friedan, Martinik, and Schenker. So let me just first give you some terminology. So there's something called the small Hilbert space, which is the space of states which are independent of the Xi zero mode. So why is the Xi zero mode special? When we do this fermionization of the beta gamma ghosts in RNS, you see that the Fermionization of the beta ghost only has a derivative of psi. It doesn't have psi without the zero mode. That means that if you write states in terms of beta and gamma, they will never involve the psi zero mode. And you can define small Hilbert space as the space of states which only depend on beta and gamma. So those states are independent of the psi zero mode. On the other hand, you can also define a large Hilbert space where you allow the states to depend on the psi zero mode. But if you like, in some sense, those states in the large Hilbert space are unphysical. So you have to restrict the states to be states which are not only annihilated by the BRST operator, which I described earlier, but are also annihilated by the A to zero mode. So of course, A to zero on the state, it just kills the Xi zero mode. So if A to zero of V equals zero, that means the state is independent of Xi zero. Now, as Friedan Martinek Schenker showed, it turns out you can describe physical states in different pictures by doing an operation called picture raising, which is you multiply 
a state in the small or operator in the small Hilbert space by Xi, and then you act with the usual RNSBRST operator. And because the RNSBRST operator is chosen to annihilate the vertex operator, that just acts on the Xi. And this operator here is called the picture raising operator. Okay, so these are some, it's just language, but it's very important what we're going to describe next. Okay, if there are any questions, please ask. Okay, so how does this help in this formalism? So if we look at this operator here, which was the operator we got from the anti commutator of two Qs, and we act on it with this operation, so we multiply it by C, and then we act on it with the INSBRST operator, we find we land on precisely the translation generator. Okay, it's this term in the RNS BRST operator, which does the picture raising. So although this algebra um, is not the usual supersymmetry algebra, and this is not the translation generator, it's equal to the translation generator up to picture changing. But picture changing requires that this vertex operator is BRST closed, which means that it satisfies the equations of motion. So the RNS algebra only closes using equations of motion. So space-time supersymmetry is not manifest. Okay, so now is the, that of course was just a review of space-time supersymmetry in the RNS formalism. And now what I'll show is how to um, make space-time supersymmetry manifest in the RNS formalism. Are there any questions up to now? Okay, so to make supersymmetry manifest, we're going to follow four steps. Okay, so the four steps are the following. The first step is to work in the large Hilbert space. So working in the large Hilbert space means we're allowing vertex operators which can depend on the C zero mode. Okay, so of course we want to still work in large Hilbert space and define states which are physical. So the way to do that is we're going to modify the BRST operator to be the sum of two terms, or more precisely, the difference of two terms. It's going to be the difference of the RNS BRST operator and the A to zero mode. So why do we do that is because, well, if you now ask for states in the cohomology of Q prime, it's easy to show that the cohomology is just going to be the cohomology of states in QRNS, which are in the small Hilbert space. So we'll show that in a few minutes. So that's the first step. The second step is to add auxiliary variables. So these auxiliary variables are similar to these auxiliary fields F and F bar that we added in the four dimensional supersymmetry multiplet in order to make supersymmetry manifest. So without these auxiliary variables, we're not going to be, get, we're not going to be able to have the space-time supersymmetry generators close without using equations of motion. The third step is to add a piece which is BRST trivial to the space-time supersymmetry generator in the RNS formalism. And we're going to choose this BRST trivial term such that the algebra now closes without picture changing. So that's the third step. We have to modify the RNS generator, but we modify it by something which is BRST trivial. So it doesn't affect anything when acting on physical states. Finally, the fourth step is we're going to perform a similarity transformation. Now that the algebra closes without using picture changing, it turns out you can form a similarity transformation so that the, the space-time supersymmetry generator is precisely the one that we had in the Green-Schwartz formalism. Okay, so those are the four steps we're going to follow. Now let me just say a little bit more about the four steps. Okay, so the first step is to work in the large Hilbert space where we have Q prime to be the difference of two terms, the RNS BRST operator and this A to zero. And now it's not difficult to show that, that the cohomology of this is just equal to the cohomology of QRNS in the small Hilbert space. And with this language, PR, picture raising is just a BRST trivial operation. So unfortunately, I'm not sure you're gonna be able to see this. Can you see the top of the screen? Okay. so. Um, I hope you can see the top of the screen. I can't. Is that a Q prime at the top of the screen? I'm These sorry. B, yeah, it should be B plus Q prime mm -hmm. of CV. Mm -hmm. 
is equal to V. So there are two terms now coming from Q prime. So the QRNS, of course, is the first term in Q prime. And then the A to zero in Q prime just kills the C and gives you a V. So you get V the minus plus sign. QRNS of QV minus V. So that comes. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, the V minus V just cancel each other. So you're just left with the picture raising operation, which is QRNS of CV. So what we've seen is that um, by working with this BRST operator, if you just add V to V plus Q prime of C times V, that's just the picture raising operation. Okay. So that's why the cohomology of this is just the cohomology uh, we had before of, of physical states in the small Hilbert space. Okay, the second uh, step is to add auxiliary variables. So the auxiliary variables we're going to add, of course, we know what we want to get, so that makes life easier. We're going to add a set of fermions, which we'll call theta alpha and P alpha, which are the same fermions as we had in the green schwartz siegel formalism. But we're also going to add a set of bosons. So these bosons are also going to be space-time spinners. They're unconstrained. So different from the pure spinner forms, and we're going to add a set of 16 fermions in the conjugate momentum, and also 16 bosons in the conjugate momentum. And we're going to modify the BRST operator in such a way that these auxiliary variables don't enter into the cohomology. So that's trivial to do by using this quartet mechanism. So you add this term to the BRST operator, and that just says that these fields decouple, that these auxiliary variables decouple. So in some sense, uh, they play the same role as the auxiliary fields in the D equals four super Yang mills. Okay, the third step is now we're going to find a sigma alpha here, such that when we take Q prime of it and add it to the original space-time supersymmetry generator, which was this, we get an algebra which closes without using equations of motion. So this is a completely straightforward computation. If you take Q, so here's Q prime. If you take Q prime, this term in Q prime, and you act with minus omega, remember omega is the conjugate to capital lambda, this just gives you a term P alpha, small p alpha, this P alpha here. And then when you take this term and you take Q of it, it will give you things which are related to dx slash theta, which remember was in the d alpha or in the q alpha of the green schwartz generator. Then you have terms which are of order theta squared or higher. So this is, these are the terms which are zeroth order in theta and linear in theta, and there are other terms which are quadratic and higher in theta. And once you add this to the um, space-time supersymmetry generator of the RNS formalism, you find that the algebra closes without using picture change. Okay, so that's the third step. And then the final step is to do a similarity transformation. So the similarity transformation is chosen such that, of course, the algebra of Q alpha prime is the same as the algebra we had before, which we got from this space-time supersymmetry generator. So all you have to do is choose R appropriately, and you can find these terms. These are the terms which are linear in theta, and then there are higher order terms in theta such that this space-time supersymmetry generator just gets mapped to the green schwartz siegel supersymmetry generator. And now after performing the similarity transformation, of course, everything space-time supersymmetry is manifest. It's precisely the same as in the green schwartz siegel formulas. So of course, the BRST operator is also space-time supersymmetric. So here it is. So it's given by, remember this term started as capital Lambda alpha P alpha, but after doing this similarity transformation, this gets shifted to D alpha, which is the same supersymmetric constraint as in Green Schwartz. Mm -hmm. The RNS term, which was gamma psi m dxm, that also becomes supersymmetrized. This pi m, remember, was the supersymmetric version of, of dx. And then you get some additional terms, which are a little bit funny. So you get some terms e to the minus phi over two times capital lambda sigma. So this is the same as lambda alpha times the, contracted with the original Q alpha of RNS, and you get this other term here, okay? Okay, so this is now the new BRST operator, if you like the BRST operator of this modified RNS formalism, which is now manifestly space-time supersymmetric. 
Okay, so now, of course, we can write down the vertex operators in manifestly supersymmetric language. So we can write down the RNS vertex operators if we like modified RNS vertex operators. But now in terms of the 10 dimensional superfields. So uh, it's a little bit complicated. Okay, so but it involves these superfields I mentioned before. So AM, capital AM, it starts with the gluon and then has the gluino as the order theta term. W alpha starts with the gluino. And then you get this term here coupling to the C ghost. So the integrated vertex operator in RNS would just be this term here. Okay. And the unintegrated vertex operator would be this V. Okay, so you can immediately see that it's, it has some resemblance to both the pure spinner and the RNS. So let's see RNS first. So if you expand these superfields in theta and you take the term which is zeroth order in theta, you find that the gluon vertex operator is precisely the terms in this which are zeroth order in theta. So the usual gluon vertex operator for the RNS formulas would be these terms here. You get some extra contributions coming from this term in FMN and this term in W alpha. But it turns out when you do computations, because these are fermions and these are bosons, this term precisely decouples from all uh, amplitude computations. So the amplitude computations involving gluons in this formalism are precisely the same as the RNS formalism. Essentially, all the higher order terms in thetas don't, don't couple because there's nothing to contract with the thetas. Okay, but for the gluino, things, is very, things are very different. The gluino vertex operator, remember, in RNS has spin fields and other stuff, e to the minus phi over two. Here, the gluino vertex operator is just terms here which are higher order in theta. So the computations involving external gluinos is very different in this formalism. Furthermore, this is just for the massless sector, but of course you can get the massive sector by just taking OPEs of the massless vertex operators with themselves. So all the GSO projected vertex operators are going to be independent of the spin field. However, I mentioned you could also get, for example, GSO unprojected states in RNS, for example, the tachyon. The tachyon vertex operator would be more complicated. Sorry that it got cut off. The tachyon vertex operator would have, or all GSO unprojected states would have square root cuts with Q alpha. So because you, they have to have square root cuts with Q alpha, it means that uh, they have to have spin fields constructed out of these space-time spinners. So the GSO projected vertex operators are very simple. But if you want to describe the GSO unprojected vertex operators, in this formalism, like the tachyon vertex operator, it would have to have a spin field, it would have to include a spin field constructed such that it has square root cuts with the thetas. Okay, so now we've constructed this manifestly space-time supersymmetric version of RNS, and now we want to relate it to the pure spinner formalism. Okay, so one thing we see is we already have several of the fields are already in common with the green Schwartz. So we already have with the pure spinner. We already have the thetas. So these thetas here, sorry. Um, these thetas here and P's are of course the same as going to appear in the pure spinner formula. But we still have these fields of half integer spin. Although space-time supersymmetry doesn't touch them anymore because space-time supersymmetry generator of course is is just the same as in the green schwartz siegel It's just something like P alpha plus DX slash theta. So you don't have to sum over spin structures in order to get space-time supersymmetry anymore, but they're still in the theory. So in order to relate to the pure spinner forms, we're going to twist these fields. And twisting these fields requires splitting these 10 psi's into five complex pairs. So the psi's have weight to conform weight to half, and we want to twist them into conform weight zero and one, which some, is somehow related to Raimundo's question, because we're also going to want to get rid of the half integer spins for the beta gamma. So the way we're going to do that is to use the pure spinners. So lambda alpha, when it's a pure spinner, it parameterizes this space, SO10 over U5. So in fact, lambda gamma lambda equals zero. So that's uh, Cartan showed that in 10 dimensions, that's called the pure spinner. It has 11 independent components. 
And the projective part of the pure spinner parameterizes the 10 complex dimensions of SO10 over U5. So we're going to use lambda alpha and its complex conjugate, which I'll call lambda bar alpha, to break the SO10 down to U5. And that allows me to split the psi's into gammas and gamma bars. So my gamma m, I hope you can see gamma m. Gamma m will define to have spin zero and gamma bar to have spin one. And that's because we're going to use the gamma ghost. Sorry, this gamma has two meanings. It can either be the gamma matrix or the gamma ghost. When it doesn't have any indices, it's the gamma ghost. So capital gamma is going to be proportional to small gamma and capital gamma bar will be proportional to one over small gamma. So this would have spin one, and this would have spin zero just because gamma has weight minus a half. And psi is of course the sum of gamma and gamma bar. You can think of these as projectors which just project into the spin zero and spin one. And now how are these related to this capital lambda, which we had before this bosonic space time spinner so it's related in this way. So we're going to decompose capital lambda into a small lambda and this other vector, which I'll call UM. And we can either think of lambda bar as being a fixed constant. That's called the minimal pure spinner formalism. Or we can treat it as a dynamical variable, which is called the non-minimal pure spinner formalism. Okay, I'm not, I don't want to go into details about that. But the point is that um, small lambda, the pure spinner, is already in this capital lambda. But in order to dig out small lambda, you have to introduce this vector um, okay? So together, small lambda and, and the vector u carry 16 independent components. That's because u has this gauge symmetry, because u slash lambda bar means that u has this gauge symmetry, so only five of the components of u are independent. Okay, now after twisting, so after doing this twisting here, by absorbing some of the small gammas into psi, only even powers of gamma will ever appear in the vertex operators if they're GSO projected. So we now can define gamma hat, I hope you can see this, gamma hat to be gamma squared. So gamma hat now has conformal weight minus one. So now we're left with a theory which just has integer spin. So we have the capital gammas and gamma bars, which have spin zero and one. And now we have beta hat and gamma hat, which have conformal weight minus one and two, just like the BC ghosts. If you want, you can also fermionize the beta hat gamma hat. And it turns out that eta hat, which would be the fermionization of gamma hat, is precisely uh, the space-time supersymmetry generator of RNS contracted with the pure spinner lambda alpha. So using this, you can now write the modified RNS BRST operator in terms of these twisted variables. And after performing a similarity transformation, you find that it has this very, very simple form. So just to, just to remind you, the modified BRST operator in RNS was this operator here. And what we've done is we've decomposed capital lambda into small lambda in U and written the psi m's in terms of gammas and gamma bars and done a similarity transformation. And then you find that you land on, on this BRST operator here. So the first term here is just the pure spinner BRST operator. And then these two terms here just tell you that the cohomology is independent of u and its conjugate momentum. It's independent of gamma bar and its conjugate momentum. It's independent of gamma hat and beta hat, and it's independent of BC. So we find just the original cohomology of the pure spinner BRST operator. And of course it's in the small Hilbert space because it's eta hat zero term. Okay, so we've landed on the pure spinner formalism by, doing, by going through these steps. And of course, one can ask, okay, what about the vertex operator? So that's actually quite straightforward to show that if you start with the modified RNS vertex operators and go to a gauge where these non-minimal fields decouple, then it's quite easy to show that this vertex operator here just reduces to the first term here, which is just the unintegrated vertex operator. And this term here just reduces to the integrated pure spinner vertex operator. 
Okay, so we've been able to relate the BRST operator and the vertex operators. And of course, the next thing we want to do is to compute scattering amplitudes and show that the amplitudes are equivalent. Okay, so let me just summarize what we've done. So um, manifest supersymmetry is of course very useful for simplifying computations. And it seems to be necessary for describing Ramon Ramon backgrounds. At least um, we don't know how to yet use formulas which are not manifestly supersymmetric to describe Ramon Ramon backgrounds. Okay, the supersymmetry algebra in RNS, it closes only up to picture changing, which means that the algebra needs equations of motion to close, which means that uh, space time supersymmetry is not manifest. But by working in the large Hilbert space and by adding these auxiliary variables, which are like auxiliary fields, we can get the supersymmetry algebra to close without picture changing. And vertex operators for GSO projected states in this phonosome can now be written with manifest space-time supersymmetry in terms of the usual 10-dimensional superfields. And after twisting the RNS variables and also defining this gamma hat to be gamma squared, then we find that the formalism is related by a similarity transformation to the usual pure spinner BRST operator and vertex operators. Okay, so what are some possible applications? So of course, the most obvious thing to do is now to construct this formalism, this modified RNS formalism in a curved background, including Ramon Ramon field. So now we can actually describe the RNS formalism in a Ramon Ramon background. And it will, it should be something like the pure spinner form uh, action in a Ramon Ramon background or Green Schwartz, plus some, of course, some other couplings to the size and things like that. Okay, but that would be an interesting application. Another more ambitious application is now to prove equivalence of the scattering amplitude computation. So of course, all the computations that have been done up to now, the two formalisms are equivalent in the RNS and pure spinner formalism. And one would like to prove uh, the equivalence without having to do the computations. Using these, these similarity transformations, it should be possible. And once you've done that, you should be able to relate the subtleties in the two formalisms. So um, the subtleties in the formalisms are different. So in the RNS formalism, just uh, quickly, the, the multi-loop subtleties are related to the need to integrate over fermionic moduli um, coming from the local world sheet supersymmetry. So integration over fermionic moduli produces precisely these picture changing operators at certain points on the Riemann surface. And changing the positions of these points is a BRST trivial operation, but that operation can contribute surface terms if you have higher genus amplitudes. And keeping track of these sur surface terms is a challenge. It turns out for certain amplitudes, these surface terms don't contribute. So these special amplitudes, uh, which are called topological amplitudes, they have the property that they can be expressed as F terms in superspace. So the amplitudes preserve a certain amount of supersymmetries. And in fact, that's a clue, as we'll see in the pure spinner formalism, there's a similar subtlety, but the subtlety also um, you can ignore when the amplitude can be expressed as an F term. Okay, so let me just finish by saying what the subtlety is in the RNS formalism, and then I'll open for questions. So in the RNS formalism, if you work with the non-minimal version, you have both lambdas and lambda bars, which means you have to integrate over their zero modes. Now it turns out that when you do the computation after performing the similarity transformation I mentioned, you get operators with poles in these lambda lambda bars. And these poles can accumulate. And if the poles accumulate such that the power of the pole is bigger than the zero you get from doing the integral over 11 of these zero modes, then the amplitude diverges and needs to be regularized. Now it turns out that uh, this regularization is unnecessary precisely for the same amplitudes in which the subtleties are not present in the RNS formula. So that's a clue that these subtleties are related to each other, but obviously one needs to know better the relation between the two formalisms if one wants to explain the relation better between these subtleties. Okay, so let me stop here uh, for questions. Sorry, I think you're muted. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, there are some, uh, there is a question by uh, Jacques Disler. Uh, he was in the chat. Probably he want to ask uh, the question himself or okay. I should read, I don't know. Uh, 
Uh, either way, um, the, the question said, when, <laughs> when computing a scattering amplitude in this uh, uh, generalized RNS formalism, do we still need to sum over spin structures on the world sheet? Are the individual terms space-time supersymmetric? So you don't need to sum over spin structures to get space-time supersymmetry. Each spin No, structure... that wasn't the question. You compute the yep. scattering amplitude. Is it given as a sum or, or is there just one term? It would be given as a sum. So before, oh. be, before doing- So are the, the individual system, terms space-time supersymmetric? My naive guess is that the individual, this is a naive guess, is that all the terms would give the same answer. All the all the all the spin structures would give the same answer. So we we could not sum over spin structures and just divide by the number of. That's my guess. Right. So the psi, yeah, that's my guess. So you're not writing a, a, a Berezinian on, on supermoduli space. That's right. So. Um, in, once you work in the large Hilbert space, I don't know how to um, how to describe things um, by doing uh, uh, by working with, with the supermoduli. Um, so I would have to introduce. I mean, you would have to work with the picture changing operators and work on patches and and do things that way. I have a very naive question, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so, so can you just tell me the what's the passcode for this? I might be able to enter it then. Uh, it's math. The one okay. you sent me? Yeah, I didn't remember. <laughs> so, so I was wondering, uh, this, this technique of you, you have a complex. You have your original Hilbert space with your original theory. Yeah. That's, that Sorry. it considers a differential. And, and you have some equations that are satisfied only up to the equations of motion. But then you're, you're saying that somehow it works better if you replace this complex by something larger, where you include this zero mode of psi, and you change your differential, but then in the differential, you put the equations of motions anyway. So this thing of like enlarging the complex and changing the differential so that the, com the homology is the same. I don't see how this really solves the issue of like having the original supersymmetry up to equations of motions. So, um, yeah, okay. Um, so, it, so you you can actually make me co-host again, and I can share screen. But, uh, but anyways, uh, let me answer your question. So, there are two steps. One step is to work in the large Hilbert space. The second mm -hmm. step is to add the auxiliary variables. So if you don't add the auxiliary variables, you won't be able to, to, ma to, um, to make the algebra close without using equations of motion. So it's similar, I, I'm, I mean, it's similar to what, what happens in four-dimensional supersymmetry. So the set of, so once you add auxiliary variables, you enlarge, of course, the off-shell space, right? So once I add the auxiliary variables, now I can define supersymmetry transformations, which of course transform me into the auxiliary variables and mix it in such a way that I no longer need the equations of motion in order to get the algebra to close. Let's see if I can share screen. Okay, good. Let me try again. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. So let me get some notes. Okay, so so let me give the example of four dimensional supersymmetry. So now you can maybe see what's going on. So here we have these phi's, right? So if you if you don't if you don't add these transformations here, the algebra requires the equation of motion. So the equation of motion in this case is just d m chi a sigma m a a dot equals zero. Without that equation, the algebra doesn't close. But after adding these auxiliary variables, 
you no longer have to use this equation to get the algebra to close. Now going to the large Hilbert space, that's just a trick to make picture changing a gauge transformation. That has nothing to do with making supersymmetry manifest. To make supersymmetry manifest, I have to also add these auxiliary variables. I don't, does that answer your question, Himun? I think that, yeah, I think it does. Okay. So there are, there are two raised and uh, Gregory Moore. Please. I just want to follow up on your answer to Jacques' question. Okay. So to, to state the obvious that, uh, you know, you could, you, so if I understood you correctly, you said that, yes, you have to choose a spin structure, but you're hoping that the amplitude will be independent of that choice. Yes. Um, which is, it looks like it's going to be pretty remarkable. I mean, you have to choose a spin structure, if I understand you correctly, because you still have those spin and a half fields. Yes. The, okay, so then, so then the obvious thing to do is to check this at, at a you know one loop computation. I agree. So, so the hope is that so the psi's are going to um, hopefully there should be a gauge in which the psi's essentially decouple. So the the point is, if we go to the pure spinner version, so here's the the pure spinner version of the computation. So of course the computations are supposed to be the same as in in the pure spinner, in the pure spinner computation. And you see that you get cancellations between the size and some of the bosonic variables um, in the pure spinner computation. So the hope is that the size would somehow cancel out. Um, I mean, let's see. Looks kind of remarkable, right? Because the psi has a zero mode in the, uh, in the Ramon, Ramon sector and not in the other one. So if you have a one point function involving a vertex operator with psi, how's that gonna work? Let's see. Um, so can you say which one point function? So you're looking at a one loop one well, point? Well, I'm not sure exactly one point function, some one point function involving, well, I mean, the, I mean, probably the simplest thing to do would be to look at a dilaton one point function, right? Yeah. Um, well, that might not be good because you might get zero. And <laughs> okay. Well, okay. No, no, no. So right, the, the 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 cancellation of the cosmological constant requires a sum over spin structures in traditional RNS, right? Yeah. So so that's, a, okay. that's as you know that's a subtle computation. So, um, uh, in this case, you have theta zero modes, right? So the zero modes are something that that need to be carefully treated. So when you add when you add these auxiliary variables, you have to, of course, integrate over them. And so you have to put a regulator in order to integrate over these auxiliary variables in order that they cancel each other out. So when you add this term to the BRST operator, um, you, of course, want these fermionic variables to cancel against the bosonic variables in the functional integral. But, but they have zero modes, so you have, to, you have to be careful with their zero modes. And, okay, that's a subtlety which... Um, I agree, needs to be taken into account. And that's essentially the missing step to trying to show that the equivalence of these amplitudes is, is a careful treatment of all of these zero modes. Um, so the field view definition more or less seems to be straightforward, but um, you have all these zero modes you need to be careful with. Um, I, but I agree, it's something that, it, it should not be difficult to, to try to check, but that hasn't been done yet. So there was a, a, another uh, hand was raised by uh, people in the third floor. Can you hear us? Yep. Yes. yes. My name is from Chicago. Yeah. Uh, Hi. Yeah, our, our name is not very descriptive. <laughs> Hi. Hi, sir. Um, so unfortunately, you missed a few minutes of the beginning of the talk, but at the point when you go from RNS and you augment it to make space time supersymmetry. Manifest by yes. adding your your uh, additional um, auxiliary variables. At that yes. point, are there any fields that are satisfying a pure spinner constraint? We there's still no pure no. spinner constraint in the story. No, so that's that's an important point. I should have stressed it more. So in the modified RNS formalism, 
these capital lambdas are unconstrained. And in order to, the, the first place you need to introduce pure spinners is when you do the twisting. So when you twist the 10 psi's to give you five spin zero and five spin one, that's where the pure spinners first enter. So although the, I mean, they enter, which means that you want to decompose capital lambda in this way. So the decomposition of, of capital lambda, which is unconstrained into a pure spinner, that happens when you do the twisting. So all of the subtleties coming with pure spinners, that appears only after doing the twisting. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, that does. Thank you. That's very helpful. I have a question about the super multiplets. With, so when you have a vertex operator, so for the massless vertex operator, we expect the super field to be special because uh, it's in a smaller representation than the generic. Yes. Uh, how, does, how does that come about in this uh, way of thinking about it? Uh, so are you asking about the massive ones? Are you asking how, how does yeah. what come about? Well, the massive versus the massless ones. Ah, okay. So, so the massless one would be this one. And now the massive one, so let's suppose we want the first massive level. So one way to get it is we would just take the OPE of two massless vertex operators mm -hmm. and extract the term which is proportional to whatever the, the I, I guess it would be, um, I don't know, a term which goes like Z or something like that in the OPE. So, it would be construct, I mean, um, okay, let me write it down. What, 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 so it looked something like this. So if you're looking at the unintegrated vertex operator, so the unintegrated vertex operator normally would be dimension zero, it would be this. The first massive level would be something like this. It would start to have dependence on both lambda and pi. So it would have an extra index here. Or it could also have things like lambda alpha, d beta. Mm -hmm. So it would still be 10 dimensional superfields, but they would have more indices. And the, the term in front of them would have, would be in dimension form. So the same, this is how it works in the pure spinner and the same should be working in this modified RNS. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, thank you. So, so you would get these pies by, for example, taking the OPE of two of these. And when you look at the poles, you'll start to get things which are proportional to DX and that would give you these pies. Not the poles, I mean, you look at the zeros, sorry, and it would give you things like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other uh, questions? Let's see. So. Well. so if there is no other question, we can, uh, we can thank our speaker, Nathan. Oh, there are questions. Uh, first, Raimundo. No, 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 those are clapping. Hmm? Ah, they're clapped. Okay, okay. Yeah. I was thinking of raising hand. Okay. <laughs> so everybody, thanks. Uh, thanks, okay. Nathan. Mm -hmm. so. so before we close today, though, uh, I wanted to uh, remind uh, that there's going to be a talk at 5 p.m. local time. So that should be around 8 p.m. Uh, UTC. Uh, that is a general audience talk, and it's going to be in Portuguese by Pedro Vieira. Uh, the link is on the web page and it's open, but it's not the same Zoom link for this uh, series of talks. And it's going to be aimed at middle school uh, kids. 